My name is Janet, and it's absolutely my privilege to be, just be part of the pastoral staff here at North Langley, and as well just to open up God's Word with us this morning. It really is, it really is a privilege, and I'm so thankful for that. Um, if you've been with us in the last few weeks, you will know that we are in a series on prayer, um, just reflecting our banner there on the wall that we want to be a church on our knees. So this is a series on prayer. And we want to be a people of prayer. And so part of that has been looking at the Lord's Prayer. Because I don't know about you, but I relate to Jesus' disciples, his followers, uh, when they had questions about prayer and wondered about how does this work? What's, and Jesus said, you know, their question for our uh, request to Jesus was, Lord, teach us how to pray. And so... Um, it's been just a delight to be diving into prayer for the last few weeks. Um, it's been great for, just, I found just for myself personally, I have, I've learned things, I've grown, I've been stretched, you know, being over in the chapel at 7 a.m. Uh, Monday to Friday last week was fantastic. About, you know, 50 people or so were able to make it out every morning and uh, for intercession. Uh, it was just beautiful. And so it's just a real joy to see God make us a church on our knees. And so we have a few more weeks to go in this series. Um, Matthew's not here this morning, as you may have noticed. Uh, Pastor Matthew is with our high school students. They're on a retreat this weekend. And so there's about 130 students and their leaders, and they are sitting under Matthew's teaching there for a weekend, um, and they're learning about the Holy Spirit. So that's great. We're so excited that Matthew gets to connect with our high school students for a weekend. But let's turn our attention to this famous and amazing prayer that um, Jesus taught us to pray. And let's pray it together this morning as we begin. Say it with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you have not left us without an example and without a practice of prayer to our Heavenly Father. Thank you for this important passage in your word. And we ask God that today as we hear, we listen, as we understand and submit ourselves to the teaching of your word, that you would speak to us by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for being here. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so as you may have uh, guessed, we are in the second half of the Lord's Prayer today. Give us today our daily bread. And the Lord's Prayer kind of takes a turn here at the halfway point. Um, here, the Lord's Prayer turns into what we call petition, asking, requesting. Lord, give us today our daily bread. Forgive us. Deliver us. And it becomes a bit more personal, doesn't it, in this half of the prayer. Um, and Honestly, if you would talk to someone on the street uh, about their concept of prayer or even maybe take a poll of us here today and say, um, what, do you, what does your prayer life look like? For most people, many people, uh, the second half of the Lord's Prayer is actually where we camp out, right? In the requests and in the petition and in the asks and in the pleas to Jesus. And now why is that? I don't think it's very complicated. It's because desperate people pray. And many times when we feel desperate, we pray. And people who don't even know God pray. They pray sometimes instinctively without even thinking about it when they are in desperate situations. They pray when they're not even sure who they're praying to or if anyone is even listening to their prayers. They pray. Um, you know, we pray when we can't find our keys. We pray when we need a parking spot. We pray when we need a job, and we pray when our kid's in trouble, and we pray when there's a cancer diagnosis, or we pray when we're going through divorce, whatever it is, we pray. Um, I saw that 
about two weeks ago, there was this funny clip that was um, going around, I don't know, on the internet. And it was a clip, and I looked it up, it was a clip of a, of a flight that had left from Dominican Republic for Miami. And um, partway there, the pilot came on and announced that there was engine failure. They'd have to turn around and go back to the Dominican. So um, someone got their phone out and was like filming what was happening on the plane. And a few women had gotten up and they were holding hands and they were praying the Lord's Prayer in Spanish. And then he captured about a row back a man like chugging a huge bottle of whiskey and, and then handing it off to another guy in a row over. And I thought, not everybody turns to prayer in a crisis. But when we get to the end of our rope, for many of us, we are desperate and we cry out to God. And here's the thing. It's not bad to cry out to the Lord in a time of crisis. It's not a bad prayer. God is gracious. God is loving. He accepts people who turn to him in sheer desperation. And isn't that a good thing? Um, Taylor Swift released a song this summer, um, and it's called Soon You'll Get Better. And it was about her mom's uh, cancer diagnosis, which had returned. And the words go like this. The buttons of my coat were tangled in my hair in doctor's office lighting. I didn't tell you. I was scared. That was the first time we were there. Holy orange bottles each night, I pray to you. Desperate people find faith. So now, I pray to Jesus too. Taylor Swift has an understanding that she needs Jesus in a crisis in some way. Desperate prayers actually have been the beginning of spiritual life for many people. Um, you may be familiar with um, John Newton, you know, the slave trader turned abolitionist who, uh, who wrote Amazing Grace. He turned to the God in the middle of a storm at sea, crying out to God for help. And then there's even uh, Martin Luther, 21 years old. He's out in a thunderstorm and nearly gets struck by lightning and promises God he'll be a monk for the rest of his life. So people turn to God in prayer and in honesty when they're in a crisis. Now, by themselves, we kind of know that those kind of prayers aren't really able to sustain our spiritual life, right? Um, most of us, many of us can fall into a pattern of prayer that we're returning to, to Jesus just in times of crisis or pain. Lord, give us today whatever it is we need. And the rest of the time, we kind of tend to rely on our own cleverness, our own strength, if we're honest. And that's why these past three weeks for me have been so significant, because that's the place uh, in the first half of the Lord's Prayer where we actually turn to God as our Father. We learn how to pray and turn our worship into prayer. We learn how to ask for his kingdom to come and his will to be done in our lives and our world. And that's where we're supposed to begin in prayer. That's what Jesus taught. See, I don't know about you, but um, often when I come to prayer and I am in a state, I'm, I'm not in a state very often. <laughs> don't ask my kids. But when I'm in a state, I come to God in prayer and, and I'm just pouring out all my jumbled thoughts and feelings and pleas and requests and, um, you know, whatever it is to the Lord. Um, honestly, it feels like I'm, I'm sometimes just multiplying my own anxiety. That, that um, you know, that self-centeredness has just kind of taken over and I end up in a worse place than I was before. But when, in my experience, when God-centeredness comes first, when my heart is turned away from that tendency to always uh, look within, then my perspective can be reframed and changed. And I'm able to turn to petition to, re to then bring my requests with maybe a different posture. But I just want to make it clear that petition is not a lesser kind of prayer. It's not as though people who are especially holy and people who just, um, you know, are these great prayer warriors pray adoration and pray worship all the time and, and you know, um, requests or petition is like more elementary or self-absorbed or lesser. Not at all. 
I was reading Richard Foster recently, and he reminds us that petition is not a lower form of prayer. Petition is actually, he calls it, our staple diet. I like that, our staple diet. It's bread. <laughs> like, and why? Because it draws us into the most basic relationship that we need to be in of child to father, of asking to receiving, the father wants to hear the requests of his children. He wants us to ask. Matthew um, 7, in there, Jesus is reminding us that you may be familiar. Uh, I think Matthew had, um, Pastor Matthew, had, had mentioned this story before, where, where Jesus tells the little, um, you know, the illustration. Like, if, you, if your child asks you for bread, would you give them a stone? Or if they ask for a fish, would you give them a snake? And Jesus said, you know, if you earthly parents know how to provide for your children, how much more our Heavenly Father knows how to give good gifts to his children when they ask. So asking for daily bread is simply asking. It's God wants us to ask. If you don't hear anything else this morning, just know God wants us to ask. We are his children. We have every right, and he delights in his children when they ask. So we're going to see how praying for daily bread can develop that kind of posture um, in our prayer life of dependence, of contentment. And then also, um, hopefully, um, you know, just engage some of the more difficult challenges or questions around petition prayer and also practices what can we do how can we develop this posture as a kid I used to wonder actually when I heard this prayer I, I didn't grow up in Canada and I understand if you're of a certain age in Canada you recited this in school that wasn't something we did in the States but still this prayer was familiar to me and when I would hear the Lord's Prayer um, and, the, and, the, and the daily bread in there I think well you know yeah, Jesus instructs his disciples to ask for these lofty spiritual things, and then, and then he tells them to pray for something as ordinary as bread. And I thought, like, is this just a mealtime request that we bring before the Lord? And um, I, don't, I don't know if you're familiar with that prayer that sometimes gets recited around kitchen tables. Um, we taught it to our kids, and it goes like this. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. By his hands we all are fed. Thank you, Lord, for daily bread. Anyone familiar with that prayer? Well, a few of you. Well, I have a problem with this prayer. Like, it doesn't rhyme. <laughs> Good and food don't rhyme. And that, would, that seriously derailed me <laughs> whenever I heard it and I get so distracted. But the theology of the prayer is great. Like, it is so good. And if we're teaching our children this or praying this prayer and actually um, praying it and thinking about the meaning, it's a very, very honest and good prayer. Thank you, Lord, for daily bread. Now, in the Lord's Prayer, as used throughout Scripture, the, the word bread is artan, and it represents that which is essential to sustain life. See, cereals and grains and breads, they were so integral to, and important in the ancient Near East in their culture that artan, the word bread, became synonymous just with all sustenance. So when Jesus is teaching, you know, give us this day our daily bread, Jesus is actually saying, ask your father for everything, all your needs, physical and less tangible things, every day. Now for the disciples or for those listening to Jesus, in this part of the prayer, they would immediately have um, been reminded of a time in history when God's people were faced with serious lack. And we're going to turn there for a moment this morning. It's in Exodus. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Exodus 16. And there is a story here of God's people. They have been freed from Egypt, uh, out of slavery. They are under the um, leadership of Moses. And at this point in their story, they are wandering. They are lost and wandering in a um, desert, area, Sinai Peninsula. It's a, it's a bit of a wasteland, and they are grumbling. And grumbling is, um, is an understatement in this passage. So when we look at Exodus, Exodus 16, let's just um, see uh, what this story can teach us. We start in verse 2, and here the... Um, people of God are 
grumbling against Moses. They're saying, if we only had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you, Moses, have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Like, wow, <laughs> that's a complaint. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. So the next morning they went out and there was this layer of dew all over the camp. And verse 14, we'll skip there. When the dew was gone, thin flakes of frost appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? And actually, the Hebrew phrase for what is it sounds phonetically like manna. And that's, where, that's what they called it, manna. Moses said to them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. So the Israelites did that. They would go out in the morning and they would gather as much as they need. They, you know, gather a little or a lot, but everyone had enough. Um, Picking up in verse 19, then Moses said to them, no one is to keep any of it until the morning. So you could use what you needed for the day, but you weren't to keep it for the next morning. However, not surprisingly, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was very angry with them. Each morning, everyone gathered as much as they needed, and when the sun grew hot, it melted away. And for some of you who may be familiar with the story, you know that on the sixth day, they could collect double because on the seventh day, the Sabbath, the manna didn't show up. But on the sixth day to the seventh, the manna didn't spoil. But God provided enough for the day. For 40 years, God provided his people with manna, with bread in the wilderness. For 40 years, they were reminded they couldn't escape the fact that they were totally dependent on God for their needs for the day. And they couldn't stockpile for tomorrow. Like nobody was open up a, opening up a manna shop and manufacturing manna products for sale and for their own profit, right? There was no greed. There was no worry for tomorrow. God provided enough for the day. Daily bread means daily bread. It doesn't necessarily mean that we get tomorrow's wants. It doesn't necessarily mean that there's any certainty about retirement plans or long-term security deposits or whatever they're called. Daily bread is daily bread. Here's a question. Why do believers, especially, in a land of plenty, like Canada, need to ask for daily bread? Isn't it a bit, like, redundant or something? There was a missionary from Haiti who observed, the majority of Christians in North America pretty much have everything they need. If they don't pray or read their Bible for weeks, it makes little difference in their daily lives. They still have food to eat and a place to sleep and clothes to wear. And I think she's right. That's exactly the place that we find ourselves in. And it's dangerous because it's a trap of self-sufficiency and individualism. Generally, we do have the ability to get whatever we need or want. And so we tend to find our security in things like savings accounts and a good job and an education and a regular income or owning a home. And these things can become our security. But a consistent prayer for daily bread helps remind us, and I think this is why Jesus is saying, pray this way. It helps us remind us that everything is a gift from above. Our ability to work, our minds, like the kindness of another person, a stable economy, the way our bodies work, the fact that food grows miraculously, um, our very breath, the new day, everything is a gift from above. And when we pray in a posture of dependence, we're reminded that God provides. Asking reminds us of our need for God. John Calvin was a pastor and theologian um, in the Reformation time there. And he um, taught that God often waits to give a blessing until we've prayed for it. And why is that? 
Well, good things that we do not ask for will usually be interpreted by our hearts as the fruit of our own wisdom and diligence. Isn't that correct? Calvin said, gifts from God that are not acknowledged as such are deadly to the soul because they thicken the illusion of self-sufficiency that leads to overconfidence and sets us up for failure. I was kind of caught by that phrase. They thicken the illusion of self-sufficiency when we don't acknowledge and ask for gifts from God. But then there are times when we are feeling the opposite of self-sufficient and we are feeling overwhelmed and discouraged and helpless and hopeless. We don't know how to pray and maybe we don't even want to pray. When it's times like this when we, there's no other option, when circumstances are driving us to our knees of complete dependency, that prayer, this daily prayer, it connects Jesus to our absolutely absolute dependence and need of him. And I don't know about you, but I have been in these places many times. And often it's regarding my kids, where I am on my knees and on my face, or it's family members, or it's a friend that is going through something that is just beyond me and seems beyond um, change. And those times is, are when Jesus um, makes me so aware of my absolute dependency on him and my inadequacy. Paul talks about this in Romans 8, that when we pray, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. That is a gift that the Holy Spirit gives to us in those times. There's a second kind of posture shift in petitionary prayer, and that's towards contentment. Daily bread reminds us it's enough for today. It's enough. Manna was collected for the day. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it, Paul writes, but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Wow, that is challenging. That is a challenging prayer in a culture like we live in that always wants more, where whether it's anxiety or greed, it keeps us grasping for more. What does it mean to pray for what we need? Like, I, I'm more inclined to pray for a year's supply of bread than for daily bread, to be honest. We worry about the future, right? Um, it's interesting that right after Jesus' teaching here in the Lord's Prayer, he, he, um, he continues to teach, and the next section is all about worry, all about anxiety for tomorrow, all about, you know, how valuable we are to him, that, if, that, that God sees us and knows our needs, all about worrying does not add one hour to your day. And when we seek God first and seek his kingdom and his righteousness, he will, he will give us everything we need. That's a great passage to camp on, and it's a different sermon. <laughs> but it's so good because we need contentment for the day. When our kids were younger and they um, sat around the dinner table, um, after they had filled themselves up and dinner was over, we would um, make them stay <laughs> and listen a little bit too. And we had a stack of books, kids' books, um, by, the, by where we ate, and they were called Hero Tales. And these books would just, um, it's just good to, to read and understand about, like, heroes of faith from the past, right, from history. And so we would look at people like... Um, D.L. Moody and Mary Schlesser and Lottie Moon and Hudson Taylor. If you don't know those names, you, you should go to the Resource Center and find some hero tales. It, it's awesome to read these stories. But one of our favorites was a guy named George Mueller. And he lived almost the entire 19th century. So he was a pastor, primarily, in Bristol, England. And he pastored the same church for 66 years. Like, that's mind-boggling. <laughs> 66 years. He died when he was 87, like, on his knees by his bedside in prayer. But George Mueller is perhaps most well-known for his care of orphans. So um, at that time, you know, in the 19th century, think like Charles Dickens, Oliver Twist, orphans in work, work, workhouses. And um, uh, George Mueller cared for over 10,000 orphans in his lifetime. But the most amazing thing is that he never made the needs of his ministry known to anyone else except to God in prayer. 
There's uh, the story in our Hero Tales book um, tells about one morning when the house mother um, of the orphanage came to George Mueller and said, um, the kids are all dressed and they're ready for school, but there is no breakfast. And so George said, well, bring them in and have them all sit down at the tables. And so they did. And uh, George Mueller uh, bowed his head and prayed and thanked God for their food. And can you imagine if you were one of those orphans <laughs> and looked up after amen and like, okay. <laughs> but there was a knock at the door and it was the town baker. And he um, came to the door and said, uh, he showed up and said, hey, um, Mr. Mueller, I couldn't sleep last night. God told me that you would need breakfast this morning. So I got, I got up and all night I baked bread and here it is. And no sooner had they taken the bread than there was another knock at the door and it was the milkman. And his cart had broken down right in front of the orphanage. And he said, Mr. Mueller, um, by the time I get the cart fixed, the milk's not going to be any good. Can you use milk today? And they pulled in like 10 huge cans of milk for the children. And the children had breakfast. Mueller has recorded over 50,000 answers to prayer in his journals. He wrote a lot. But he recorded over his lifetime over 50,000 answers to prayer. He wrote this, I live in the spirit of prayer. I pray as I walk about, when I lie down, and when I rise up, and the answers are always coming. And I believe that the answers were always coming because George prayed and because he was looking for them and recording them. He lived in a posture of dependence and contentment. Now, it doesn't mean that hard questions don't remain about prayer and I can't wait to get to heaven and sit with George I'll just call him George and he'll say who are you <laughs> but I'll say George your life was such an inspiration tell me what it meant to live in that kind of dependence and contentment because there were tough times that he had in his life as well and I look forward to that because these questions do remain like why pray doesn't God already know what we need does it matter and what happens when our prayers go unanswered? Jesus did speak to his disciples about the fact that we weren't supposed to go on babbling like the pagans. He said, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Like, really? Philip Yancey wrote a book, Prayer, Does It Make Any Difference? It's also in our resource center. And it tackles the question, why pray? Here's the simplest answer, because Jesus did. Because the Son of Man who spoke the world into being, who sustains everything that exists, he felt a compelling need to pray, to take things to his Father. He prayed, Jesus prayed as if it made a difference. He prayed as if um, spending time with the Father was just as important as spending time ministering to people. He said, ask, seek, knock. And those are imperative verbs, which means they're a command, they're not a suggestion. Sometimes we wonder, should I just keep bothering God with all my requests that are for myself and others? Like, doesn't he, isn't he kind of busy running the universe, you know? Jesus himself, though, knew his father, and he just flooded heaven with requests over and over. You can see that in his life. And the Bible instructs us to present our requests to God, to make known our requests to the Lord. Does God already know? Yes, but he wants a relationship with us. He wants us to ask. Oswald Chambers taught, prayer is the way the life of God is nourished. We look upon prayer, we look upon prayer as a means of getting things for ourselves, but the Bible's idea of prayer is that we may get to know God himself. It's a relationship. Think about it. When your friends or your, with your friends or your kids, you don't, you don't want them just to presume that you know what they need without asking. Communication builds relationship. And I don't know about you, but, um, you know, sometimes when we're maybe feeling far from God or, or maybe you're here today and you aren't even sure about this relationship with God and what Christianity is all about, glad you're here. But sometimes when we go to God and we're in that place, um, our prayers may begin and you know, honestly with like, God, help. I, I need your help. I, I need this thing or I need help with this thing. And then often 
there's a bit of a self-reflective pause and then maybe a restart. And we might think or say to ourselves, like, I know I'm not perfect. I know I haven't talked to you in a long time and I have no right to ask, but like, please God, we instinctively know, don't we, that relationship matters, that otherwise our prayers can seem um, presumptuous. And we think, like, who am I kidding? Like, if I'm honest with myself, I know that my failures and my shortcomings, they give me no right to ask God for anything. But here's the ama amazing thing. The amazing thing. It's that God wants to have a relationship with you and with me. He offers forgiveness for the things that we can't even forgive ourselves for. He wants to be in relationship with, with us. Do you know God? Does he know you? He wants to know you. And prayer is a way for that to happen. When we become children of God, we belong to God. He knows us. He hears our prayers. Jesus said this amazing thing. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. My sheep know me. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them. They follow me. This is the absolute foundation for prayer. He's our papa. We are his children. We can ask. He hears us. Do our prayers matter? I think this, this picture from Revelation was included in our Bibles for that very reason. It happens in, in John's vision. The Apostle John was having a vision, and he, he saw the throne room of heaven. And it's recorded in Revelation that the, the prayers of the saints, the prayers of the people, are, are held in these giant, I don't know, maybe I get the picture wrong, but it sounds like they're held in these giant gold bowls of incense. All the prayers of all the ages are collected. And then in chapter 8, I think it is, the, the angel, um, angel's instructed to like pour out these, these prayers on the altar. And here's what it says. John records this. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. The prayers, your prayers, mine, everyone's, they rise before God. They're heard. They're kept. They matter. But it's still, sometimes we struggle. D does God hear and answer prayer? And why are my prayers not being answered? Well, we go from Revelation to Bruce Almighty. <laughs> Bruce Almighty was a, was a, was a movie. Um, I don't know how many years ago. But in the movie, Jim Carrey, he's raging against God because life seems to be going wrong. And he says to God, he could fix my life in five minutes if he wanted to. Do you ever feel that way? Then um, Bruce encounters God, who is, of course, Morgan Freeman. And he lets Bruce be God for a week to see if he can do any better. And, um, of course, at first Bruce is using all of his God powers for selfish gain or, you know, in ungodly ways. And then he starts to hear thousands and thousands of prayers in his head all at once. And so he attempts to deal with this, um, setting up an, an email, you know, getting all the prayers on email. And, um, and that's overwhelming him because he just can't answer all these prayers that fast. And so he does the reply all yes. And he says, there you go. Now everybody's happy. And yet the following day, he wakes up and crazy things are happening. Like 400,000 people have won the lottery. And the payout is so small that everyone's super angry. And a riot breaks out in the street. And, you know, Bruce can't figure this out. And he's upset. And he says, I gave them what they wanted. And Morgan Freeman wisely answers, since, since when does anyone have a clue about what they want? You know, if we think it through carefully, and if we um, are truly and humbly acknowledging, you know, um, what goes on in our hearts, um, we know that the limits of our own uh, understanding, um, like how, how would we even have the courage or how would we dare to believe and pray if we truly believe that somehow God is bound to grant us our every wish, right? Like he's a genie in a bottle, that he must answer yes every time, that somehow we have the all-knowing ability to ask rightly 100% of the time. But God doesn't give us everything that we ask 
And I'm not talking here now about, you know, trivial lottery wins. I hope you're not really praying about that. But the big things, the important things, I don't know why. I don't know why. And yet, we are, we are encouraged to ask to persistently appeal to God earnestly. And if you're not hearing an answer, or if it's an answer that, that isn't what you wanted, then keep praying. And pray that God will allow you to rest in his mercy and his will. Last week, Matthew talked so well about this. If you didn't hear that message, you should go back and listen to it. He talked about confident hope, your kingdom come, and yet restful trust, your will be done, boldness and humility. We need both. Tim Keller makes the point, if we overstress submission, we become too passive. Yet if we make our requests known to God without a sure foundation and acceptance of God's wisdom and sovereignty, we will become too angry or too disillusioned when our prayers are not answered. And yet God encourages us through scripture, we see it, to be honest, we don't pretend when we encounter deep disappointments in life. There are scores of people, like inside the church and outside the church, whose spirits are crushed because they prayed fervently for something and they didn't get the job or their mother died of cancer, or their child was stillborn, or maybe they aren't able to have children at all, or they lost everything in a flood or a fire or whatever. See, it doesn't make sense to say prayer works because I got what I wanted and you didn't. Yet Jesus tells us again to ask. And do things happen when we pray? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. But often in ways that we cannot understand or are even able to trace out. I have a sister. Her name is Rebecca. She is one year older than me. She's a nurse practitioner. She's an amazing nurse practitioner in a large hospital in Pennsylvania where I grew up. And I have watched her walk through intense tragedy that was not of her own making. About 10 years ago, she re received uh, the shock of her life when actually criminals tried to blackmail her for hush money to cover up her husband's double life. And one day her life came crashing down as she found out that her husband, who um, Mike, who was a prominent doctor in the community, was someone she didn't know at all, that he'd been living a lie their entire marriage hiding a shockingly immoral, deceitful life. So two days after she found all this out and he was exposed, he took his own life. And he left my sister to pick up the pieces with three angry and hurting adult kids. And Rebecca, I witnessed you know, her walking through just tremendous grief and anger and distrust of God and of Christians as well, and sometimes making careless choices, and yet honestly wrestling with God. And I asked her permission um, this week when I talked to her to share what she's learned about prayer. She says this, as I look back, when I went through everything with Mike, even though it was so terrible, I somehow knew that if I didn't reach out to God in prayer, that all would be lost. In those days, months, and years of shock, even though I had no idea what was going on and no control over the situation at all, I was able to know that God was right there with me. I think that before that time, I was not really praying for things that were important to God. I was thinking about the present, and like a child, I was distracted by so many temporal things and demands. I was so distracted, I could not listen to God. So maybe, I don't know, maybe God sometimes intervenes and allows large things to happen to us. I had to learn, I'm still learning, that I belong entirely to God. If I'm not being obedient to what he's asking of me, maybe my independence blocks my prayer life with him. How do I trust? Because I cannot afford not to. Because I know that there's no other way. Even after everything that happened with Mike, God allowed another massive disappointment in my life, which was actually a harder situation to trust God for. I still don't understand why but I had to leave it with God. And I'm still learning that maybe 
All of my prayers may not be answered as I want them to in this present time. I've been helped so much by reading and pondering people like Henry Nouwen and Brennan Manning and C.S. Lewis's book, A Grief Observed. It helped me to get away from pat answers or simple responses from others. Can I still have confidence in prayer? Mostly, I want God to reveal himself to me and then help me embrace his answers. I struggle the most for my kids. I pray they find God, but what if that does not happen in my lifetime? God is building my faith in small things, so I keep on praying. But I no longer believe that God just wants me to be happy. I do know I'm finding contentment, and that comes through obedience. This is still a journey for me. Some days are still terrible, and some days I just pray that, I will not, that God will not let me quit. But in the end, I will deeply seek God in all things. I talked to my sister Um, A couple weeks ago, she had just returned from a missions trip to Albania where she got to introduce Jesus to someone for the first time. She was so excited. You know, even though, like my sister Rebecca, we have to walk through things that we don't understand and we struggle to make sense of unanswered prayer, um, we maybe doubt God's kindness, it's drawing near to God for his comfort Um, And that's what we really need, even if we don't understand. Pete Grieg, I was reading his book this last uh, few weeks. It's also in our resource center. It reminds us that we are actually perfectly able to trust that which we cannot perfectly understand. I've been so captured by that sentence. We are actually able to perfectly able to trust that which we cannot perfectly understand. We can also be perfectly honest with God. My sister quoted this verse to me um, a couple days ago, Psalm 73, whom have I in heaven but you, and earth has nothing I desire besides you. When we don't get his answer, we still get his presence. So how do we develop this posture of petition? Um, I know I probably will never stop struggling with prayer. I'm learning, I think I'm growing in it, but man, my mind can wander in no time flat when I'm praying. And it can wander into tasks for the day, or it can wander into worries for tomorrow. And God knows, he's so gracious with me. But still, I want to develop daily habits of prayer. So how do we do that? I think just basically setting out times in our day to connect with God is so important. Um, the morning, praying scripture, praying to the Lord, bringing my requests the, of the day before him, my daily prayers. Um, evening, uh, looking back, um, examining the day with the Lord and trusting him. Uh, life groups this week are going to be looking at something from Dallas Willard that Tim has called a, a way of, of walking with God in a day if you haven't done that and want a pattern for that, and Tim calls it Dependence Day, <laughs> learning, learning dependence in a daily way. Um, I had a friend named Dan in high school, and he, and he we, I went to a big public high school, and he was a Christ follower, and I wasn't really at that time. So, I, but we would all eat lunch together, and whether he was by himself or with a bunch of others, he always, whether it was a sack lunch or whatever he had, he just, bowed his head and prayed at mealtime. Like, I, that made a huge impression on me. And, um, and I know that uh, at least pausing three times a day, we need physical food to fill us up, right, to sustain us. What about for our souls? God has kind of put these patterns in our day. We need food, we need him. How about three times a day, wherever you are, you take time to pray, uh, gratitude, um, thankfulness, Pray with your children. Teach them the pattern of praying um, multiple times a day and remembering the Lord's goodness. It's such a good habit. And what a beautiful reminder that this morning as we gather around the Lord's table, it's communion. I want to end with a passage from John 6. It's a dialogue that um, is recorded with Jesus and the crowds that followed him. Now, he had just miraculously fed like 5,000 people with bread and fish, too, and they were still demanding. They said, what sign do you have for us? Our ancestors got manna from heaven. 
So it's recorded here in John 6, and we'll start in verse 32, Jesus' response. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who gave you bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. <laughs> then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. This bread is my body, which I give for the life of the world. When we come to this table, and today, as we take this bread, we remember that Jesus is the one who satisfies our spiritual hunger. His death, his resurrection, which we remember here today, remind us that we can be forgiven and live in daily dependence on him. If you're here today and you are experiencing an emptiness inside, a feeling like a, a hunger, actually, for something more than this life offers. As the bread and the cup are passed today, our servers can come forward. As they're passed today, um, would you just maybe make this your prayer to the Lord Jesus? Ask him to come and fill you. Ask him to come and be everything you need. Ask Jesus to forgive you because of his death and resurrection. He, can, he has made a way for you to have complete access to the Father. So would you hold the bread and the cup? Um, and would you um, take this time in your own heart to remember what Jesus has done for you, to bring your request before him? We're going to pray before the servers pass out the, the bread and the cup. But just as we do, don't let this moment pass you by. Remember, Jesus, you are the bread of life for the world. Can we pray together? Lord Jesus, thank you so much that because of your body broken for us, because of your blood shed for us, we can come to you with our every need. You are our good Father. You hear our prayers. Lord, remind us that you sustain us, that you are everything that we need. As we take this bread and this cup today, may it be a reminder that you, our bread of life, have given your life for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you, servers. When you take your um, cup and your bread, just hang on to it, and we will take this all together. Um, just a reminder that Jesus um, instructed us to pray, give us our daily bread. And it's something we do together, but it's also something that you can take to the prayer room. If you are, if you are carrying a burden, a request, a need, um, it's good to pray with somebody else. So the prayer room is open and you can find someone there who will pray with you.